then move on to a uh, question that has uh, got 33 hits. And going back to the focus on a sustainable company, which the three of you are, is Denmark a good setting for being a sustainable company? Um, is this like the best place to be, I guess? Um, who would like to start? Yes, Nils? I think it is a good place for a sustainable company. I think we have, so we have issues society-wise on being a good place to run a company altogether. But I think especially on sustainability, I do think we have an advantage. Um, and why is just, that? Yeah. Let me just give an example. Um, for instance, the, f the fact that Denmark, ever since the beginning of the 70s, when we had the oil crisis, uh, uh, none of you can remember that, but when I was a kid, we could not drive on motorways on Sundays. Imagine, in a free society, we're not allowed to drive on motorways on Sundays. Now, that actually kickstart something. That made politicians back then, I think, actually pretty cleverly look way ahead. That's when we started district heating in Denmark. And we got really a world leading position. It created companies like Danfoss, like Lockster, like others. So, so today, when, when, when China looks at how they get their energy efficiency up, they call it energy intensity. They look for world class solutions. Guess where they go? They go to Copenhagen, to Aarhus, and to Sunnerville. Because that's where the best technology in the world is. And, uh, and, and we asked them why they come, they said, that's because you have the best thing. If that would change to Germany, then be sure we would go to Germany. So we actually, because of this connection between a society that does value sustainable solutions, that does look forward and are willing to invest something in demonstration, it allows for companies to build scale and competence that we can now export. So I would clearly say, and there's, there's much more examples here, I think that the Danish attitude here on setting high standards of wanting to do that, I think helps. Uh, now, there would be a lot of things about the general conditions of running a business that I could wish would be a lot better. And that actually counts the other way, but I read the question here as specifically saying, in terms of sustainability, is this a good country to be in? I would say yes. Steve? Only one thing uh, to add to what uh, Nils was saying, uh, and uh, that is uh, it's also a, a good place to recruit young people who has an interest, who have an interest in sustainability. It kind of permeate, permeates our society. Uh, so those kind of ideas are readily pursued uh, by the scientists we have in our laboratory, uh, laboratories. They are tuned in to this kind of thinking and that adds to all the good things that Niels was saying. Jan? Yeah, I, I agree on that. We are well known more or less all over the world for being a sustainable uh, country uh, and it is deep rooted into uh, to our culture as Nils also was saying. What, what wonders me a little bit is that even in Denmark and to my best knowledge nowhere in the world we still have, uh, still do not have an education in sustainable economy but well who knows maybe one day it will come. No, that's a good point, and uh, maybe that's something that we could actually learn from where an inst educational institutions like that exist. I personally don't know, but I'm sure it exists. Uh, so what could Denmark learn from other countries or companies? Because of course we're good, but we could be better, I guess. Nils? Yeah, that's, so now we are getting close to something I think is really interesting here. Uh, and it may be difficult for me now to stay on the topic of sustainability, because I think where we need to learn is that we don't have to look that far away. We could look across Øresund or we could look uh, south of the, of the border. We need to make sure that while we do all these good things, while we have a lot of competency, while we are probably ahead in the way we think about sustainability, it, is not, it cannot happen in a world where we can forget everything about productivity and cost and all those kind of things. And we are drifting, and we have been drifting too far out there, and I think the biggest risk on us being successful in this area is not our ability to generate ideas or do things or recruit people that want to work in this business and has, is competent. It's actually that the general conditions for running business has changed pretty dramatically over the last 10 years. And I would say, and, and I, I think we were together in China, uh, the prime minister was, was uh, traveling out there and we had an evening where we had a stand in buffet and we had a lot of Chinese investors there, people in China with a lot of money and a wish to do business. And of course we would like to say, okay, come to Denmark and bring your investments to Denmark. Now, what do you think they look at? I mean, it's nice if they can tap into some of the competences that, that we have built, but it's more important probably for their investment that they can also make a good business out of that. But the 
basic conditions are not very much different from what they could do if they go to Hamburg or they go to Melbourne. And that's where I think we have the biggest issue right now. Jan? Well, just to add what, what Nils said, it is certainly right. And within the last 40 years, two things very important has happened in the world. First, the container industry was developed, which means that we can f move physical products extremely fast, extremely cheap all over the world, which means that we are in competition with everybody around the world. Second thing will be the internet. What are the internet doing? Well, the internet is very fast, very cheap, moving brain capacity. Wherever in the world you're sitting on a computer, these things are available all over. So also when it comes to brain work, we are in competition with everybody. So it is extremely important that we are staying competitive. And for the time being, Denmark is unfortunately, in that respect, uh, not very competitive. Um, just uh, to add to this, uh, at uh, the same time as uh, we have these problems in Denmark, uh, many other countries around the world uh, are kind of uh, scrambling to uh, get on the sustainability uh, track. Uh, if you look at, uh, at China, uh, China has very uh, kind of solid goals for uh, uh, reducing their energy intensity. And uh, with the way China is run, I'm absolutely certain that they will actually achieve those uh, uh, energy intensity reduction targets. Uh, if you look at uh, Brazil, uh, Brazil has uh, embraced the whole idea of using renewable input material uh, to create fuel and a future chemical industry uh, in a very clever and, and very large-scale manner. So uh, other people are moving uh, in a big way, uh, uh, while we are, I think, uh, we have the problems that, uh, that uh, Nils uh, and Jörn were alluding to. We also have a tendency to uh, not calculate, uh, uh, but uh, jump to uh, what I call political correct solutions, rather than do uh, the background life cycle assessments uh, for the solutions that are proposed. The Chinese and the Brazilians don't do the same mistakes. And on those answers, um, the next questions is a very good follow-up. Let me just get it uh, up on the screen. Um, this one. Because, uh, oh, no, that was the one we got. This is very, uh, very high-tech. Uh, what could, uh, oh, where did it go to? It was very, oh, maybe I just pushed answered, even though it was not answered. So I have to re re recall the question in my own mind. The question was, so how do you sell sustainable products in emerging market countries where sustainability is not such a hot issue? But maybe there's a small prejudice in that, because actually they are involved in this. Yeah, Jan? Well, uh, seen from our perspective, we have to admit that it is for us very difficult because in these countries, very often it is the individual house owner who are deci deciding what kind of windows they, they want to put in, and um, they don't care so much. Many of these countries do not have very high prices of energy and so on, and, and, and that we can really feel. There's a significant difference in the products we are selling uh, in, in certain countries compared to others uh, in, in, in that respect. Sting. Uh, I, I, I think the basic answer is that we are selling based on exactly the same parameters as we are in all the other countries. It has to be cheaper and it has to be better uh, and uh, compared to their uh, local circumstances. Um, I, I'd like, if I may, just to add, uh, uh, I think, an anecdote to this. We, we are working uh, uh, very uh, uh, closely with the textile industry. The textile industry, uh, the, the mills, not the, the people that are suing the stuff, but the, the mills, is uh, among the most polluting industries in the world. Uh, and uh, the way we have solved our pollution uh, uh, problems here in Europe and the United States is that uh, we uh, moved that industry to China. Now the Chinese are uh, starting to implement the, the uh, environmental regulations that they uh, actually uh, decided on five years ago, but now they're starting to implement it. So the textile industry is moving to Bangladesh. 
Uh, and uh, next stop, as I understand it, is Africa. Uh, Africa is the only place in the world, Bangladesh and Africa seem to be the only places in the world left where you are allowed to pollute. So uh, one of the things we can do in those countries and what we do do is to uh, work closely with the government and the industry to develop alternatives, which we think we can, that uh, are uh, significantly reducing the pollution from these industries so that they can allow them to stay in the country and maintain the jobs and maintain the value generation uh, in those countries. But if we fail, uh, we didn't make it in Europe, uh, we are a little late for China, we might uh, make it for Bangladesh before it goes to Africa. All right. And Nils, selling? Yeah. Sustainable products in emerging markets? Yeah, I, I think I would just like to tell you about one example, and that's in the northern part of China. There's a city with three and a half million people where the way they do heating, of course, there's only heating a certain part of the year, so the comfort in those apartments or houses are not that nice. But when there is heating, it's done by a lot of small boilers placed around, each of them fired with coal or with brown coal. It means that the air is so polluted that you can actually, it, it's always uh, foggy when you're there. Now we made one project that took heat that was wasted on a steel factory in the same city, closed those boilers and used the heat from the, from the, uh, the steel company. That gives heat now to one and a half million people. That's Copenhagen. In a way that they have heat all year round, much more comfort. They can actually control the heat. The cost of the heating is zero. The project pays back to the steel company, to the city, and to the people who get cheaper energy in less than two years. And the air gets cleaner. Now give me one good example why they wouldn't do that. And then remember there's like 200 cities in China of the same size that could be interested in doing the same thing. So I, I, think, I think to the question, there is ample opportunity of selling green technology in emerging markets. How was that uh, project financed? By the city. By the city. Mm. That's, that's another area we haven't talked about, but that may be something we could do better in Denmark. That's financing. All right. So let's uh, dig into the toolbox and be very concrete also about you being here in this room, because uh, now you have asked the question, what should students here from BBS learn about sustainability? The most important thing to know about sustainability when leaving the room? Yes, who will start? That's a tough one. Thinking, thinking, thinking. Hmm. <laughs> it can be more than one thing, maybe three things, max. Right, who will go first? <laughs> no, all right, Steen, you always have an answer for everything, so you will have an answer for this one as well. <laughs> well, I, I think I just have to start talking and then... <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, well, anyway, uh, uh, I... I think uh, the first uh, thing you should take away uh, is that it's serious, it's real, uh, that uh, it's something that uh, you will have to uh, somehow uh, address uh, when you go ahead because uh, it will influence your life and that of uh, your children when you get some uh, and, and uh, in, in very profound ways uh, unless we find good solutions to it. So, uh, and, and um, uh, well, just to, uh, um, when I talk about, uh, when I'm out talking about technology, uh, we very often uh, meet technology people that uh, uh, will talk about uh, new social media and other very interesting stuff. And I, this is fantastic and this is good. We need uh, answers to very basic questions also. It's not enough with a new social network. Thank you, Stephen. And now the other two have their questions. And uh, Jan uh, Nils actually got to uh, raise the hand first. So, <laughs> yeah, Nils, now you go. Uh, now you were laughing because we were all standing here thinking about it. And, and, and in my way, I think I think the short answer is nothing. I don't think you need to have a lot of courses into specifics about sustainability. I think that's a business opportunity along a lot of other stuff. So I would hope you learn a lot about identifying opportunities and actually understanding how to make business plans around that. Because it's, for me, it's nothing else than that. So if there was one thing I would say then, instead of nothing, because that's probably not the right answer, but then it's, then it's at least 
to understand some of the fundamentals around why is it we would like to go there. So I would hope that you could be trained in understanding at least the impact of CO2 on society if we do nothing, at least some of the society costs to not doing anything. The relationship fossil against non-fossil uh, fuel and, and so, so to think about the issue of sustainability. If that's there, then I'm sure the rest of it is actually down to doing business. It's just a business focus trying to take advantage of, of something. And I think that goes back to all your fundamental uh, courses. So I would not think this is something special. And, and I would not be looking for a sustainability engineer or a uh, sustainability economist. I think that's, uh, that's not the way to think about just, it. Just go for the profit and the rest will follow. Yes. <laughs> And now, uh, Jan, please. Yeah, uh, it's difficult to add more, but, but I also think that, that a general attitude and knowledge uh, uh, about the issue is important because it will be very, very different from company to company what kind of specific uh, knowledge you would have. So, uh, yeah. Moving from the toolbox from you guys to the toolbox of governments, it's always easy just to ask for legislative regulation to help one get started, but uh, what legislative action is necessary to make it easier for companies to assume a sustainable profile? Yes. Nils, you want to go first? Uh, I think the short answer is predictability. We need regulation that actually goes a little further than next year's uh, financial budget for the, for the, for the government. Because we are actually, as companies, making pretty heavy investments with paybacks that actually go into the future. So not knowing under which conditions we need to operate the day the new product or the new solution is coming out makes it very difficult. It basically means that the risk on that investment goes up, and you all know that if the risk goes up, then we have to discount at a higher factor, then the NPV of the investment goes down, and then the risk that we will not make the investment is higher. So it's very, very important that predictability is there. And as Steen was saying, I fully agree. I think there is a government role in making sure that new technologies get into volume and get into a situation where they can survive on their own. And I'll give you an example of, uh, of solar in Germany, a big success in Germany of actually bringing solar into the, uh, to the society. But it's been like over time they had one regulation and then suddenly they changed for another one. And the really good one is when they start saying, in six months we will change the regulation. <laughs> Because then, then I, one or two things happen. If they change for the better, then nobody's buying for six months, and then they buy a lot just after. If they change for the worse, then everybody buys in those six months and nothing happens after that. Now try to run a business under those circumstances. We go straight from not being able to deliver, to lose our, all our money on freight and flying things around, to not making money because we're not selling anything. So they're really not helping businesses. If what they are trying is to launch new things and help giving birth to new technologies, then it needs to be predictable over time what they do. So we would like high standards, we would like predictable uh, legislation. Yeah. Exactly, uh, as Nils was saying, the, the predictability is extremely important. On top of that, uh, within our industry, that the building codes around in the different countries, that the authorities will stretch uh, the, the, the industry, but not too much, because then you come into stupid situations if you suddenly have to do enormous change in a very short time that is seen from a society point of view ridiculous because you put too much resources into it. So a good cooperation with the authorities about what is possible at what time and then stick to that. Stephen, would you like to add something? Well, um, maybe just uh, by explaining how predictability created uh, the bioethanol industry in the United States. Uh, this uh, regulation were in place for 10 years. Uh, in those 10 years, initially, there were subsidies. And uh, it was clear from the start that these subsidies will be phased out, would be phased out in 10 years. Uh, now, uh, the U.S. have created their industry. It produces 10% uh, of the U.S. Uh, gasoline, 5% of the world's gasoline then. Uh, it has created 600,000 jobs in uh, rural America. Uh, and uh, it has, all of that has happened because it was predictable for 10 years what's gonna, what, what would happen. Now, uh, this predictability uh, is uh, is gone from the U.S. political scene because of uh, other things that I 
will take a half an hour to explain. Uh, but uh, uh, that means that essentially the deployment of uh, second generation cellulosic uh, in the US has stopped and this is something that happens in Brazil, China and uh, parts of Europe instead. So as you can see, basically the next uh, question with 22 votes actually have been answered, I guess, by the panel. So I'll, I'll move down to, uh, to this one. Uh, that also is a very important issue, I guess, to talk about. Uh, also from a Danish pers perspective, do you see emerging market competitors and as competitors on the sustainable agenda as well? Often it seems that people assume that the West has the monopoly on sustainable solutions. Jan? Yeah, definitely, at least in our industry, all over the world, everybody's running after that. I mean, uh, very few years ago, Danish political people thought that, well, we should just run the dream, green uh, agenda and then we will survive in a good way. Forget about it. Everybody is on that. I, I think I already answered uh, the China, Brazil, lots of other developing countries, India, they are all on that agenda uh, and uh, uh, creating uh, great companies that uh, uh, of course, uh, make uh, good uh, business uh, in uh, in this new arena. But how close? How close are they to Novo Science uh, standard? Yeah, I think uh, they are making good uh, progress on wind turbines and a lot of other stuff. We are still ahead. <laughs> but uh, and you are comfort that that it will remain that way? No, no, of course not. No, we are fighting every day to uh, maintain that position. <laughs> Nils, I'm sure you have the uh, same. I, I can only echo that. I believe we're still ahead, but I think we're working very, very hard on staying ahead because it's, uh, it's clear. I mean, the days when China wanted to be, to be the manufacturing side of the world has changed. Now it's all about technology transfer and they're very specific about what kind of technology they want to get access to. That's the technology that's going to be worth a lot of money in the future. And 10 years from now, there's no doubt in my mind that sustainable solutions will be real important in all parts of the world and who would like to be able to develop those? Everybody would and especially the Chinese. So, so I would fully agree on that. And it's then a question right here I can see. Great because I was just about to say now you're getting close to the end so now raise your hands if you have questions and we have run here on row three. Thanks. It was actually a follow-up question to the previous question. Uh, about uh, regulation. So uh, if you go back uh, and try to remember when you decided to uh, switch to a sustainable business paradigm, uh, was it, uh, would you say that legislation pushed you to do it or was it other things that made you take the strategic decision? For, for us, it was not uh, legislation. This was, uh, um, I think uh, very much a reflection of the fact that uh, that uh, the product uh, and the opportunities for, with our technology kind of uh, presents uh, the sustainability agenda to you. So uh, uh, it was more like a reflection of uh, in the future uh, our customers would need uh, to make sure that they produced with less raw material input, with less energy, uh, at the end of the day, they would need uh, sustainable input rather than uh, uh, than oil, uh, and um, and they would not be allowed to continue to pollute as much as they did in the past, uh, and uh, and so uh, all the projects that we embarked on were projects where we kind of anticipated that uh, these pressures would be put on uh, companies, not because re uh, regulations in our case, not because regulations were uh, put in place. Uh, when we, uh, when we started. The rest of you, Jan? Well, that decision, I think, in, in our company was taken way before I, I joined. We have always had uh, an attitude of taking care of the resources in, in those days, of course, primarily due to money, not to use more material and so on than absolutely necessary. Uh, it has turned out uh, that, that we have been uh, extremely much more uh, aggressive concerning uh, working with the authorities uh, on this issue because at a certain time those making the billing codes around in the world, uh, world has simply a wrong perception about w how should windows be to minimize the yearly energy consumption in the houses. So we have done a lot of work 
uh, teaching that together with a number of other uh, uh, companies. So, so it has been an ongoing development. Uh, yeah, I would I would say the same. I think I can point to to uh, to situations where legislation helped move things forward a lot faster, but typically not. I think the if legislation needs to work, it's either a big country or it's like EU. Like very specific legislation in Denmark doesn't really help much because the country is too small. So no big company can develop a totally new product line just to sell it in Denmark in these kind of, you need more volume than that. So, so I often tell ministers it's much more important that we go to Brussels and we try to push up the standards for the entire EU for us to operate. Then we have a country like Denmark that is totally out of whack on, the, on, the, uh, on what we're doing. But, um, so I think a little bit like Jörn is saying, I think Danfoss was onto this before I was born. Uh, and it was not because some, uh, some legislative force made something. Um, we have often actually been ahead of that. We have, we, have a, we have made the products that would allow authorities to be stricter on legislation because now they knew there was a solution out there. And one good example is, for instance, in the US where 20% of all electricity goes into running air conditioning systems. We had solutions that could make those much more efficient. And actually, the last thing George Bush did as president was he basically regulated that and increased the level of energy efficiency air conditioning systems needed as a minimum. So that really worked. That brought a lot of products in play. But it was not like he did that, and then we went back and said, gosh, we need to make those products. We had those products. So when they made that, it actually just moved some of the business over to those products. So they influence, but they don't drive, I don't believe. I agree with my colleagues. Yeah. And then we are getting closer to the end. There's a question up there. There's now, now, now you're getting out there. OK. But the time is closing, and we definitely need the answer to this last questions before we uh, we end the session but let's have a question there P uh, please stand up uh, hello uh, i'm from china so my question is uh, about uh, how do you face the challenge from chinese local competitors who enjoy the stronger local government relationship have the lower co uh, production cost and also they have the access to the world class tenant thank you um Yuan? Well, our story in, in China is, is very special. We moved out there in 84, and nobody has seen windows built into the slope roof, and they claimed that was impossible. And it took us around 10 years to convince them that that was possible without leaking. And you have to know that the worst thing which can happen to a building is water coming in, because it will destroy the construction over the years of the building. So uh, after 10 years, we started to have uh, a, a decent uh, business in China. And then it said, boom, and we had 40 local competitors who made windows, which on a distance for the untrained eyes, you couldn't see the difference. And they started to sell that many times at prices uh, where we couldn't hardly buy the raw materials for the products. And they sold it and they built it in, but they couldn't keep the water out. So that was very, very tough for us because then the Chinese population came back and said, there you see, it can't be done. So uh, we have had a, a very tough time in, uh, in China in that respect, and we are still struggling quite a bit uh, with these things. So uh, China has been very special uh, for us. And, and, and also when we, when we go into the sustainability part of that, uh, we have unfortunately seen that the local uh, competitors uh, they are simply unfair in the way they are marketing their products concerning how they are performing. And that's, uh, that's also a big uh, issue for us. Yeah, it's a different territory. Nils, I'm sure you have Chinese yes. experiences. I, I, I will say, I think I'll start out saying that, uh, that I, I hear below the question basically an assumption that we are sitting somewhere in Denmark at Danish cost trying to compete in China. That's long gone. When we're in China, we develop products for China in China. We produce them in manufacturing facilities that are just as efficient and as cost effective as the, the, the Chinese companies we are, we are competing with. We have a Chinese sales organization that has a reach comparable or bigger to many of the Chinese companies we're competing with. So we are, we are actually there and we are competing head to head. And we are not, uh, we are, we are not from that point of view, we are not scared we are in the middle of it and we, we fight very hard and there's very clever uh, Chinese competitors as there are very good 
US competitors. So, so I think we are beyond the point of thinking we can sit remotely and do something. It's, it's a 5,000 people Chinese organization led by a lot of Chinese managers, applying a lot of the same principles, but being able to tap into some of the knowledge and some of the worldwide scale we have. That's how we compete uh, with, with smaller Chinese companies. And Steve, Novo is in China? Uh, yeah, very much like uh, Nils is saying, we produce in China, we do research in China. Uh, our, one of our advantages relative to Chinese companies is that we have a global kind of network uh, uh, of customers and, and partners uh, that uh, today they do not have. But uh, if I should add one thing uh, to it, then uh, we try as much as possible to be part of uh, the uh, uh, part of China, as we do uh, in other regions where we operate. And uh, two years ago, for example, to just put an anecdote on the table here, two years ago, the, the, the Chinese and the US government they uh, met to talk about cellulosic bioethanol. And they had uh, delegations from China, uh, government delegations with, uh, supported with uh, Chinese uh, business people. And the US uh, also had uh, a government uh, and business delegation. Uh, uh, it, and th these were the two delegations that met. We had uh, three people in the Chinese delegation, three of our Chinese, and we had also three of our American uh, uh, colleagues in the official U.S. delegation. So we just try to be part of what's going on in the society in which we operate, and that goes for China as well. All right, last word, Jan. Uh, a little thing to add. Uh, we have had production in China since 1990. Uh, the funny thing which is taking place the last few years for us in China is that actually uh, what, what we are making the best business out of, that is uh, our products from Europe importing into China sold at uh, very high prices. So that's a kind of strange development that, that our Chinese uh, produce product for the Chinese market uh, competing with the local uh, Chinese competitors uh, that market is not developing as well as the high-end uh, market with products which they simply demand is coming here from Europe. Yes, well, that takes us very well into... Uh, I know you have a question up there, but we're running out of time, but I'm sure maybe you can uh, grab the three gentlemen outside and give them your question. Uh, let's take the last question. There was one thing that uh, here in the end was a bit... You, you had the Chinese business a bit different. Uh, from, from Velux, anyway, Novozymes and, uh, and Denfoss, but uh, do you disagree on anything? I mean, you're all three focused on sustainability and uh, we're a lot, uh, <laughs> a lot of agreement. So, uh, Nils? We probably support a different football team, I think. <laughs> but uh, but um, uh, I think if you wanted real disagreement, you should probably have had a utility company, an oil and gas company, and then one of us. Because those are different mindsets. So, so I don't think you should be very surprised that we are not here with very different mindsets. But if you had asked us a question like, where do you think the Danish subsidies should go? Should they go to, to heat pumps and solar and, uh, and all those? Biofuels. I would be happy. Windows. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, so that's probably the, the level of detail we need to get into to get some real disagreement. Among us. So if nothing... Further to add to that, I would like to thank the three of you. Thank you very much for uh, debating this discussion. Thank you. Thank you.